Okay, today's daf we're going to be learning is Yavama daf Samach. I have a few monthly sponsorships. This month's learning is sponsored by Bracha Ratner in loving memory of her mother, Anna Ratner, Sarah Bat Yom Tov Verachel, on her fifth year at site. She came to the U.S. at a young age. She raised four children and was one of the most curious people who really cared about others and prioritized family. This month's learning is sponsored by Yad Yamin Ladies for the Rafu Shleim of Asher Ben Devora Feda. Today's half is sponsored by Belinda Krakey in loving memory of Jeffrey Rhodes, Yehuda Yidl ben Chaim Yerachmiel on his 53rd yurt site. He died in 1969 as a young husband of Madeline and father of Belinda. He never saw the legacy he left of his daughters and grandchildren, Jonah, Noah, and Dahlia Krakey. And today's half is dedicated in memory of those murdered yesterday in a terrorist attack in Elad in Israel, Oren ben Yiftach, Yonatan Chavakuk, and Boaz Gol, and Rufu Shlema for all those injured. Difficult evening. Okay. Um, we're going to get started now at the bottom of Nun Tet Amubet. We saw this Braita about a Kohen Gadol, and we're trying to define what is a Betula. What is this Betula that the Kohen Gadol needs to marry? What if he himself had had relations with her before marriage? So the question is, right, Anusat Atzmo, Mefutat Atzmo, in either which way, whether he raped her or whether he seduced her. Right? A question was asked just before class, you know, how could we have this Kohen Gadol who seduced a woman or raped a woman? Be working as a Kohen Gadol, which is an excellent question um, that I don't have a good answer to. They don't seem to be addressing this in the Gemara, but it is a very difficult element that is missing here. Um, so, in any case, it said here, Im nasa nasui. If he married her already, then it sounds like they're saying they stay married. But what we saw was Rav Huna said in the name of Rav, of Rav. No, he actually has to divorce her. Nasa nasui means the marriage went through, but he has to divorce her. He can't stay married to her. Because she's a bi'ula, right? A woman who had to have relations before marriage, even though it was his bi'ula. So, Rav Acha Bar Yaakov says, so what's the relevance? That's what we said. He's, he's exempt from the knas, the penalty that one's supposed to pay to a, a woman who you seduced. In the event that you marry her, you don't have to pay the knas. So since he married her, he doesn't have to pay the penalty, but he has to divorce her. So now... We're going to disagree. Rav Gavia is going to say, I don't really agree with Rav. And, and I think there's a problem with what Rav said. As a Rav, and he basically is going to understand it differently. I'm a Rav Gavia mi Bektil. I'm a Lishmata Kameh Ravashi. He went from Bektil and he said, I told Ravashi the following. It's actually not Rav Gavia who's going to say this, it's Ravashi. Amar Lei, Rav Ashi said to him, Vaha Rav, Rabbi Yochanan, Damre Travayu, but wait, how could Rav have said this? Rav himself. <coughs> And Rabbi Yochanan had both said, Bogeret, umukat eitz lo yisa. If the woman was beyond the age, remember we said there's a, a, an age limit on who he can marry, if she's beyond the 12 years and six, 12 and a half, basically, or she's a mukat eitz, she already tore her hymen in some physical accident. Ve'im nasan, right, lo yisa, he can't marry them. Ve'im nasan, nasui. But if he married them, he can stay married to them. That's what nasan, nasui meant in that case. Meaning he doesn't have to divorce her. Nobody would think that if he married someone who was too old or he married someone who was a Mukat Eitz, who had torn her hymen, nobody would think he would have to divorce her down the road. Why? Well, very simply, because Alma Sofaliot Bogeret Tachtav. It's hard to say the Kohen Gadol can't stay married to this woman if she's 15 years old, let's say, because even if he marries her when she's 12, she's eventually going to become 15. So it's not like there's a problem for a Kohen Gadol to be with a woman who is right now 15 because any wife he marries is going to eventually get to age 15. And same with a mukatez. So faliot mukatez tachtav. If he, again, he shouldn't marry these women ideally, but once he's married to them, in any case, he would have been married to a woman who's technically a mukatez after he has relations with her the first time, her time, her hymen will be torn. So these two situations are situations that even though maybe he shouldn't marry them in the first place, but once he's married to them, it's no different than another Kohen Gadol who's going to be, end up being married to a woman who's beyond the age of 12 and 6 months and beyond the age uh, and beyond having her hymen torn. So likewise, you could say the exact same thing in this case. Because what happened? He had relations with her before marriage. But it was he who had relations with her. So again, hachanami. Likewise here, sofaliot bula tachtav. Once he has relations with her when they're married, any woman who he marries is going to end up having relations with him and be considered retroactively, right, a woman who we have relations with. So what's the difference whether we have relations with this woman before they were married or after they were married in the end? To, again, he shouldn't marry her in the first place, but once he marries her, it doesn't make any sense that he should have to divorce her. And therefore, they end with Kasia. Now, 
One could distinguish between those cases, but the Gemara seems to say that this would be in the same category as all the others, and Rav said in the others, he can stay married, and therefore she sh he should be able to stay married to her in this case as well. Okay, now we're going to move on to this machloka that we didn't fully understand yesterday, and now we're going to try to understand it. We're going to have two different explanations. The first one will be rejected. The second one seems to be accepted. Anusat chavero mefutat chavero lo isa. Now, if she was raped or seduced by somebody else, right, seduced basically just means, right, that a, a relationship, right, having relations outside of marriage. So now, lo yisa, he can't marry them. Her, ve'im nasa, what if he did, and they have a child? What's the status of the child? Revelezer ben Yaakov omer havlad chalal. Chachamim omrim havlad kasher. So the question is, what's the root of this debate? Normally, a Kohen Gadol marries an almana, a grusha, a divorce, right, a widow, a divorcee, a zona, any of the women he can't marry, the vlad is a chalal. So why here is there a machloket, right? Because here it's a little bit different, we'll see. Amarav hun amarav, halacha ke Rebelezer ben Yaakov. So first we have a psikat halacha, both by Rav Huna in the name of Rav, and also v'chein amar Rav Gidol amarav, halacha ke Rebelezer ben Yaakov, we pass him that the vlad is a chalal. Some people say that the version of what we heard from Rav Huna Marav was a little bit different, and it wasn't coming to say we hold by, it was coming to give the reasons. So my time, so I'm a Rav Huna Marav, according to the second version, and this is the first attempt at understanding the machloka between them, what's the root of the debate. My time in the Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, because Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov held like Rabbi Eliezer. Okay, what was Rabbi Eliezer, remember? Panoi habala pnuya, remember that? A, a single man sleeps with a single woman. That woman is a zona. Ah, once she's in the category of a zona, then it's obvious the blood is a halal, because zona is a halal. So that's the first attempt at understanding Rabbi Lazar ben Yaakov. It seems like the simplest approach. He holds like Rabbi Lazar, any woman who had any kind of sexual relationship before marriage is a zona, and therefore this woman is a zona, versus the other opinion which is, right, Tanakama holds like the other opinions who don't think that that's called a zona. It would, right, and we're going to see, like I said, all the five opinions about what all these opinions are about what a zona is in tomorrow's stuff. So, um, so now we say, um, wait a minute. You can't say that Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov held like Rabbi Elazar. Why? Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov kavinaki. Ve'ilu beha. Amarav Amram Amarav and Alcha ke Rabbi Elazar. We're going to see tomorrow's daf that they paskind halacha is not like Rabbi Elazar, and we also know that the Mishnah of Rabbi Elazar ben Yaakov is kav We've seen this recently, which is it's very clean. Okay, it's unclear how exactly to translate this term, but what it means is his transmissions, all of his traditions that he had about his Mishnayot were very clear and meaning we hold like him. So if we hold like him, then it doesn't make any sense that he would hold like Rabbi Elazar because we don't hold like Rabbi Elazar. That would mean we don't hold like Rabbi Elazar ben Yaakov, and we know that we generally hold like Rabbi Elazar ben Yaakov. So therefore, it doesn't make sense to say this. Okay? So therefore, we're going to have a second attempt at understanding the machloka. Rav Ashi Amal, b'yesh chalal mechai ve'ase kamiflege. Rabbi Elazar ben Yaakov saval, yesh chalal mechai ve'ase, and Rabbi Anan savre, en chalal mechai ve'ase. What's chai ve'ase? We've seen this many times, right? Chai ve'ase means a positive commandment, right? That sort of, it's derived that you can't do something from a positive terminology in the Torah. This part, okay, now we're going to read the psukim and then you'll see. Almana, I'm reading from Vayikra 21, verses 14 and 15. Almana ugrusha v'chalala zonat ele lo yikach. So that's the negative commandment. Do not take, I'm reading from the end to the beginning, do not take, meaning don't marry, a widow, a divorcee, a halala, which is the child born of one of these unions, or a zona. You're not allowed to marry any of those. Okay, et ele lo yikach. So these you can't take. Remember this word et ele. In the middle of the verse it says, and these you can't. It sounds like it's separating the first part and the second part. Ki im betula me'amav yikach isha. What can he take? Only a betula from his nation, meaning a virgin, right? And this is where we get all these definitions of what a betula is. So this woman is no longer a betula. Now, is she a divorcee, a widow, a halala, zona? No, she's none of them. Again, she would only be a zona if we hold by Rabbi Elazar, but we just said we don't hold by Rabbi Elazar. So she's not in any of the first categories. She's only 
included in he needs to marry a betula. That means own, that's a positive commandment. That's this is who you're supposed to marry, as opposed to this is who you can't marry. Now, obviously, we derive from there you can't marry the following people, but that's not a negative commandment in the Torah. So we basically say, according to this, um, ah, wait, the next thing that's really important is the next verse. The next verse says, Velo yechalel zara'o ba'amav, ki ani Hashem akadisho. You cannot, right, don't do all these things because we don't want you to destroy your children. Chalal, right? Your children will be chalalim. So that means, it sounds like the simple reading is everything in the verse before is a chalal because it seems to be referring to that. So let's read the two opinions here. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov saval yesh chalal michai ve'ase. Right, so the ra- Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov says there is a chalal from not keeping this positive commandment. The Rabbanan savre en chalal michai ve'ase. Rabbanan savre, oh, they hold only in the negative ones. So if a coin marries an almana, a grusha, a zona, a chalala, then the child will be a chalal, but not if it just doesn't fit in the category of a betula. So now... We're going to have more in depth how they read these verses. My time to Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. Dichtiv. It says, "Al munal gurusha v'chalala zonat ele lo yikach ki im betula." As I said, that's the whole verse, and then it says, "Uchtiv v'lo yichalel zarob amav." Right, and then it goes on to say, "And all these, a child from these will be a chalal." Basically, don't do this so that you don't destroy your children, and that's akulu. That refers to the entire previous verse. That seems like a simple reading. Ve'rabanan. Ela hivsika inyan. Rabbanan say, no, it said in the middle of the first verse, et ele, these, right? These lo yikach, which means there's a split in the pasuk. It's like section A is negative. Section B is positive. Section C is lo yichalel. That only refers back to section A, okay? Because the ele made a break, which means that when we talk about a halal, it's only going to refer to the first part. So he views this word Ela as a separation between the first two to say the law is not the same for both. And that's why the rabbis think it's not a halal, the child. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, what's he going to do with this word Ela? And Ela seems to be saying just these and not other things. Ela, let me ute nida. Ah, Ela is to say, no, only in Amano, da, 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 all these will cause halal, including the end of the verse as well. What's not going to be a halal? If a Kohen Gadol has relations with his wife when she's in Nida, and they have a child, okay? That is not a halal, even though it's pretty wrong that he did, but that wouldn't create halalim, right? Halalim come from mis, right, improper relationship from the beginning, not that she's in a status at this present time of being a Nida. So that's what Ela comes to exclude. Now we're going to have two comments on this drasha of uh, Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov. First, Kaman Azla Hadatanya, according to who does the following Brite go, and it's going to be obvious it's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. Me'ele, that's a quote from the verse. Atau sechala, v'i'atau sechala minida. Okay, so that's clear. According to this Brite, the Ele is coming to exclude the Nida, which is Kiman Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. Number two, so now you might wonder, okay, it's pretty obvious why they're saying this, but maybe because in a minute they're going to raise a question on him. So maybe they wanted to show, though, that there's support for his opinion in this Brite. On the other hand, we have a difficulty with his opinion, which you might have already thought about, which is Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, Kasha. The Ele, if it's really coming just to exclude Anida and not to separate between the first half of the verse and the second part of the verse, the Ele should have been at the end of the verse, because that means... White, there's five things, the four low tasses, the one positive, and then it should have said, Elelo, right, Elelo Yikach, or some sort of Ela should be at the end and not in the middle of the verse. That's actually a difficulty on his position. So, again, what we did so far was to try to, first thing we dealt with today was Imna Sana Soi, tried to understand the two different options. Does that mean if he married her, it's okay, meaning the marriage is good, but he has to divorce her, or, and then he just doesn't have to pay the knas for the mafute? Or does it mean he actually can stay married to her? Because in the end, in any case, she's going to end up having been slept by by him. And therefore, it's not such a big deal to keep her married, just like the Mukaretz and the Bogeret. Um, so two approaches there. And again, we had two approaches here to understanding the Machloka between Rabbi Lezer and Yaakov and the rabbis. Is it based on the Machloka Rabbi Lezer and the rabbis about whether Panoya Bala Panoya, if a single woman has one relationship, one sexual encounter before marriage, does that make her a zonah? or not, and that's why the kid would be a halal, 
or which we rejected that option, then we said, no, really, it's based on, is there a halal from chayve asi? Because this is forbidden only through a positive commandment. So therefore, it's not clear whether it would be a halal or not. Tanu Rabbanan. Now we're going to a new topic, which is connected. This was all learned out from the word bitula, right? Isha bitula yikahu, right? And basically the Kohen has to marry, a Kohen Gadol has to marry a bitula. Where else does bitula appear by Kohanim? It's a very sore point in my family. Um, and anyone else who comes from a house of Kohanim, a uh, woman, which is a bat Kohen, okay, the daughter of a Kohen, her brother can only become impure to her when she dies, right, which basically means going to the funeral, the burial, all that, can only do that if she's a bitula, okay? Once she gets married, okay, we're going to read the pasuk, okay, I'll read it inside. Ula achoto ha bitula akova elav asher lo haita leish. There's a very long description here. We're going to darshan each part of that. Who is a coin allowed to be metamechu when it comes to, right, his mother, father, brother? But when it comes to his sister, only his sister, who's a bitula, who's a virgin, ha krova elav, who's close to him, asher lo haita leish, who is not with any other man, la yitama. Only to her can he become impure. So now that means he can't be, right? A coin can't come near dead bodies in general, except for close family members, but not to, right, his, his sister, only if she's in this status. Now, first of all, it makes sense in terms of, we talked about this, right, where the, the woman kind of leaves the husband, the, her, her own family and moves into the husband's family and like kind of becomes part of their family, according to, right, the, the way their, their traditions worked. So she's no longer really part of his family anymore. So that's why you can't become impure to her. Right? That's the way they view it. Having only three brothers, right? It's a little bit difficult for me to swallow this halacha. Um, okay, so achoto arusa. So now the question is, what if she's betrothed? Okay, see, that's what you were wondering. So what if she's betrothed? Right? And we're going to have a whole list. We're going to have a machloket between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda on one hand, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Shimon on the other. Although if you look at the chart, I split Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Yoshua because there is, I'm sorry, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Shimon because there's one issue that they disagree about. Um, and you'll see here from the chart, there's two issues they all agree about. And there's two issues they disagree about. One is a machlok between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda against Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Shimon. And the other is a machlok between Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yossi against Rabbi Shimon. Okay, so there's all different permutations here. So, Achutom Arusa, if she's betrothed, and then she's not exactly right, she's still kind of part of her family, but she's also designated to this guy. So, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yudah, Brim, Mitamela. They can be impure to this woman. Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Shimon, Brim, E Mitamela. They can't be anymore. Anusa, Mufuta, we're basically going through all the categories we discussed by the Kohen Gadot. Anusa, Mufuta, Divoyako, E Mitamela. If she was raped or seduced, no, she's not a Betula anymore, that's very clear. He can't be metamela, even though she's not married to anyone. Mukat eitz, very fascinating. E metamela, again, she, her Torah hymen in some accident or some other way, she's not a betula anymore. He can't become tamela, even though it seems antithetical, right? The whole idea is whose family is she part of? It seems a little strange. Tivrei Rabbi Shimon. Oh, but no, this is only Rabbi Shimon's opinion. Why does Rabbi Shimon say this? Shaya Rabbi Shimon Omel, Ruya the Kohen Gadol Metamela. Shein Ruya the Kohen Gadol E Metamela. He's going to say the definitions are a hundred percent the same as the Kohen Gadol. So even though maybe it doesn't make sense here, Betula, Betula. There it's Betula. Here it's Betula. But no one else agrees with him. He's got a unique opinion here. Everyone else thinks of Mukaretz. Of course, he could be Metamela. Ubogeret. What about a Bogeret? Right. So this the Kohen Gadol couldn't. Well, Divrei Metamela Divrei Kol Adam. Everybody thinks a Bogaret can be, even though the Kohen Gadol not, so it's a little bit tricky. But um, but everyone seems to agree with the Bogaret. Remember, we saw also there were different opinions about a Kohen Gadol, whether he could only marry a Bogaret or not. This we'll see in tomorrow's daf as well. Anyway, everyone agrees a Bogaret who's not married, who's still a Betula, is allowed, right? Not betrothed, not anything, is her brother's allowed to be Metamela. So again, let's just review, and the, the chart's very helpful. Anusam Mufuta, everyone agrees, no way. Bogaret, everybody agrees, yes. Mukaretz, most people think, yes, he can be Metamela. Only Rabbi Shimon, who says we hold the exact same definitions as Kohen Gadol, says no. And Achuta Rusa, we have this debate between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda, who say yes, he can be, and Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yossi, who say no. Soon we're going to see how they get this all from the verses. So, my time in the Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda. So, now we're going to start with them, and there's a long... Um, there's a long uh, 
chart about this. Okay. Yeah, who, I see you're asking the question, who's checking about whether their hymens are torn? That's a very good question. It's not clear that anyone's checking. Although, if you want to talk about checking, wait till the end of the DAF, where we're going to see some very strange checks they did on women uh, to see about these things. So, hold off on that. Okay. My time at the Rabbi Meir Rabbi Huda. Did darshe hachi. They darshan like this. Ula achoto habitula. Okay, so now we're going to start darshaning that whole pasuk. Your sister who is a bitula. Okay, so that clearly comes to say, not if you were seduced or raped. You might have thought, I can exclude them as well. It says, who was not with any other man, which seems to make it clear that it's the man that's the issue and not getting hit by a stick. Right? In other words, only one who became not a bitula because of a man and not because of something else. Hakrova. Now we have all of a sudden, right, if she's close to you, that would seem to include another woman. Who would be close to you? Lirabota arusat. That was their opinion. One who's betrothed is still close to her family because she's still living with them. So that's going to be on the side of, yes, you can be. Elav, right? Krova elav to him. You could just say hakrova. Why does it have to say elav? That comes to include another woman. Lirabota bogeret. Teach you also a bogeret. Remember, that's someone who's above 12 and a half. Ha, lamalikra. Okay, so now we're going to start with a question on the last one. Why do you even need a pasuk for bogeret? Why wouldn't you need a pasuk? Well, ha, ma, rabbi meir, bitula, afilu miksa, bitula, masra. If you remember, rabbi meir, we had this drasha. Rabbi meir says, bitula, we had the bitula, and then bivtuleha. Right? If you had just had bitula, it would have meant... Even if you're just partially a virgin, which means even if you're, right, it, you grow up and as you grow up, your body starts to change somewhat and you're not exactly considered a betula like you were before. Well, betula seems to indicate even that would still be a betula. As long as you have some part, right, then he darshan bivtula comes to exclude that. But in the beginning, he said the word betula, which is the word that appears in our verse, sounds even if you're a little bit of a betula, meaning even a bogeret as long as you haven't had relations. So you wouldn't need a special drasha to teach that, just by the word betula would have indicated that. So they say, no, it's true. You would have needed it. Why? Because you might have just said, well, betula appears here, betula appears by the Kohen Gadol. We're going to learn the exact same thing. Now there, right, we said, Begeret is not allowed to marry the Kohen Gadol. So you might have thought, there you need a na'ara, therefore also here you need a na'ara. That's why we need a drasha. So even though Rabbi Meir agreed that the word betula normally indicates even a bogeret, but since by the Kohen Gadol it says bivtula, we exclude the bogeret, so therefore you would have thought maybe here we exclude it as well because you would learn the halachot to be exactly the same. That's why we need the trust to say, no, 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 it's not the same. Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon. So that was all the drasha out of Rabbi Meir. Now we're going to go Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon. It's going to be a bit of a strange order. They're going to darshan the pasuk in the exact same order that we darshan that the pasuk goes. But then they're going to start raising questions in a bit of a different order on different parts. So we're going to go a little forward, then backwards, okay, on different parts of this bride. So Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shiva, my time, my. So Darshe Hachi, this is how they darshed. La achoto ha betula, pra la nusa umufuta umukat eitz. Now this, by the way, does not refer to, right, this is specifically Rabbi Shimon, who said Mukad Eitz can't. Okay, it's not Rabbi Yossi. Later we'll get back to this. But Achotob Tula, virgin comes to exclude anyone who had relations or had their hymen torn for some other reason. Asher Lo Haita, now Haita last time we said was to not exclude the Mukad Eitz. In this case, we say, what's it coming to exclude? Can't exclude the Mukad Eitz because we already, right, it, it's already, right, it's, sorry, it can't include the Mukareits because Mukareits is excluded according to this. Asher lo aita pra la anu arusa. Lo aita leish means she wasn't married to a man, but if she was only engaged to him, betrothed, she be, he'd be allowed to. Right, because remember, that comes to say, um, sorry, just one second. No, sorry, pra la arusa, sorry. Asher lo aita leish would come to exclude the arusa, that the arusa, Sorry, um, right, Arusa ain't a right? They couldn't. Prad Arusa comes to exclude. He can't become Tame to the Arusa because she was Haitali'ish, right? She had Kiddushim with someone. So that's excluding the Arusa. Ha Krova. But what about one who's close that has to include something? Now, according to the first opinion, that included the Arusa. He excludes the Arusa. 
So, Akrova Lerabot Alusa Shenit Garsha. If she got divorced from engagement, right, divorced from marriage, no, she's already gone. But divorced from engagement, that could be. Okay? If she's divorced from engagement, then he can already go back and be impure to her. A love, what does that include? This is the one thing they agree about, Lerabot Atabogin. Okay? To include the Bogin. So now we're going to start with this drasha about the Arusa Shenit Garsha. I told you we're going in a bit of a different order. Hakrova, the Rabot Arusa Shenit Garsha. So now they say, Vahama Rabbi Shimon, Ruya le Kohen Gadol Metamela, Shein Ruya le Kohen Gadol Ein Metamela. So wait a minute. How could you say Arusa Shenit Garsha? What's an Arusa Shenit Garsha? What's her status in Halacha? She's a divorcee. Even though she was only betrothed, she's a divorcee. She can't marry Kohen Gadol. Now, what did we say? Rabbi Shimon said, anyone who can marry a Kohen Gadol, he can be Metamela. Anyone who can't marry a Kohen Gadol, he can't be. In Arusa, they got divorced, for sure can't marry a Kohen Gadol. She's a divorcee. So how could you possibly say that? So they say, Shanei Hatam de Rabbi Rachmana Krova. The word Krova comes to say there's one exception to the rule. So now they're going to ask the obvious question. If you're already giving exceptions to the rule, right? Rabbi Shimon said, across the board, we're going to say whatever's true for a Kohen Gadol, except for that. Well, Iyachi Mukareitz Nami. Right? Well, then why don't you say also Mukareitz? That would be obvious to say the brother can be Matami to his sister who tore her hymen in some accident, right? What's the connection? So why don't you exclude that one as well? So they say, Krova, and we had this the other day, Achat Velostein. It only includes one woman. And we're going to include that one. So now the obvious question, why this and not that, right? Umara Ita, why are you going to include the Arusa that got divorced and not include the Mukat Eitz? So, Haid Avibama, Se, Haloit Avibama, Se. Nothing physical transpired to the woman who was engaged and then divorced, right? Nothing physical happened to her body. So therefore, we're going to call her still a Betula. But the woman who had her hymen torn, she's already, something happened to her. She changed, and therefore we're going to exclude her. It was very similar to something we saw um, the other day. For Rabbi Yossi. Now we have to deal with this split between Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Shimon in the Mukat Eitz case. So Midashav Kele Brazuge, since he left Rabbi Shimon on that issue, right? He differed with him on that issue. So, Michlal de Bimukat Eitz ke Rabbi Meir Svirale. Well, now we have to redo the drasha according to him. He must think that the Mukat Eitz we derive from what words, remember? Asher lo ish. The only issue was because she was with a person. She wasn't with any person, but she lost her virginity with, you know, her, she didn't really lose her virginity. She tore her hymen from some accident. That's excluded from this verse, and that's what he's going to learn it from. But what's the problem? So here, let's read. Minale mi lo ish. But the ha But the lo ish, he used to exclude the arusa, who was already with a man, right? She was engaged. That already excludes her. The brother can't be with Tommy. So, chad mi lo haita v'chad leish. We're going to say, ah, lo haita comes to exclude the arusa, because she was haita. Remember, often the Lashon of Havaya refers to Kiddushin. So, she was far haita leish, and that's where she's excluded from. Leish comes to exclude a person and not from a, tr- from a piece of wood, okay, or from some sort of accident. Now going on in their drashot, and questions on their drashot, we're now going to the last one. Elav l'rabot habogeret. Now, what's the problem with this? You can obviously figure this out. Rabbi Shimon said, a bitula, normally just the word bitula means a bitula shlema, complete bitula. Right? Then he had said, right, but bitula comes to exclude the Bulgarian. But when he said bitula, this is the opposite of Rabbi Meir in the previous. Bitula means a complete bitula, which means a Bulgarian would not be included in this, right? So now, if that's the case, a bogeret is not, according to betula, you would need a complete betula, and this is a bogeret, she's not a complete betula. According to him, a betula shouldn't be part of someone a kohen can be metame to her. And yet it says, le rabot bogeret. As opposed to, with Rabbi Mary, we said it was obvious this was the case, why do we need to say it? Here it's the opposite of what we would have said. So, tam adide nami mehachi, didarish hachi. If you just had the word betula, we would have excluded the bogeret. But since it says a lav, it's coming to include something that would have been included, but right, would have been excluded, but it's not. A lav comes to say even a bogeret he can be impure to. So again, it's that's the whole reason there's a drasha, because the simple reading wouldn't have said that. 
That's the end of this sugya. This was all to get to, again, what we did so far today. First, we analyzed these two opinions. Again, the, at the very beginning, I'm going to leave that aside, but then we analyzed these two opinions, Rabbi Lezben Yaakov with the rabbis, whether the vlad is a halal from an usat chavero and mufutat chavero. Then we took this concept of who can marry a kohen gadol, the betula mentioned there, and we took the betula mentioned by a regular kohen, to whose, which sister can he be metametu? What's the status of sister? She has to be a betula. But it had all these other wording in the verse, which seemed, right? So from all those different wordings, we got to two to three different approaches about which, what this, in which case can he be impure to his sister, in which case can he be, be? And we basically showed all the drashot that got to the different opinions. Now we're going to move on to a different topic. We're going to learn this, this big kula. Okay, you might say big, might not big. I don't know how many cases it involves, but it definitely is a relevant sugya. Which is, notice in the Torah, it never said that a Kohen can't marry a Giyoret, a convert. But we know this to be the case, a Kohen's not allowed to marry a convert. Where does that come from? Well, there's a concern that a convert, we assume she must have had relations before converted. And therefore, he can't marry her. Because she falls into the category of a, zo- of a zona. So now, we're going to see at what age, though. And this all goes back to our age of three and a day. A woman is Ru'uya So comes Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai, and he says... She converted before age three, she can marry a Kohen. Okay, because we assume she's not Ruya Libya. So now the question is, okay, where does he get this from? And the rabbis disagree, by the way. They think a convert from birth is a problem. Okay, this is a very big important sugya um, and very relevant to converts who convert at a very young age, which is common. Um, right, a family converts and they convert their children, are they considered converts that can't marry Kohanim? So, according to Rosh Hashim Yochai, it's allowed, and we're going to see a big debate, do we hold like him, do we not hold like him in the Gemara? Um, I'm not getting into practical halacha lamase, um, but this is the sugya. So now, he says she can. Here's his proof. In the Battle of the Midianites, and in Sefer Bamidbar, it says all the young women that didn't write taf bin Hashim or the children that didn't know Mishkav Zachar, meaning they never have relations with anyone, you can keep them alive. What does Rahi say? Well, Pinchas was among them. He was a Kohen. And the idea is keep them alive because you can marry them, even though they're right. If you convert them, you can marry them. So here you see it, even the Kohanim could have. Again, it's not the clearest proof who's to say the Kohanim could have married them, right? Just because Pinchas was there, but they assume because Pinchas was there, that it means Kohanim included as well. That's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Rabbanan who disagree, what did they say? Why did they keep them alive? They kept them alive to be their servants, not to marry them and convert them and marry them. So then they say, if that's the case. So now, where do we get to, right? Bat shalosh shanim biyom achad nami. If they kept them alive, right? Where do you get to this age thing of three and a day. So they say, Kidaravhuna. Diravhuna Rami. Ravhuna raised a contradiction from two verses in the section there. Ktiv, it says, Kol Isha Yodat Ish Limishkav Zachar Harogu. Okay, it said there, any woman who knew a man who had been in relations with a man, um, Harogu, kill. Ha ena Yodat, if she hadn't had relations yet, Kimu. Michla, now from here it says, Isha which means a full-grown woman, we're going to basically say, if she had relations, she dies. If she didn't, we keep her alive, right? This was in the battle. They were supposed to kill the people in the battle. But who were they supposed to kill? Only women who would have relations. Notice children are excluded from that. So it seems to indicate children, right? Whether they have relations, whether they didn't have relations, you can keep them alive. It also says, but now here's the contradictory pasuk, any young women, meaning children, who had never been with anyone, you can keep alive. Now that seems to imply the opposite of what we just said. Hayade, if they have been with men, harogu. So one person indicates it's only women we have to kill. Children you keep alive no matter what. The second person indicates children you can only keep alive if they haven't been with a man. So how do you resolve this contradiction? It's all about kol ataf ben Hashim, who can you can keep alive if they lo yadu. That means they were under age, 
and kol isha is they were of age that they could have had relations already, which is going to be our three in a day. So therefore, the pasuk that talks about the isha, we're going to assume is older, right? It all depends, and then it really doesn't depend whether you did or whether you didn't. It depends on whether you were potentially capable of having had relations versus not potentially capable of having relations, and that's a proof for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Tanya Nami Hachi, there's a brighter to support this reading of the verses, and it doesn't really explain much, it just says, this is how we read the verses, V'chol Isha Yodat Ish, Biru Yala Ba'el HaKatum Dabel. Okay? Kol Isha Yodat Ish means she potentially could have, meaning she was over the age of three. How do you know that, right? Maybe it means she actually had relations, like the simple reading. Because of the contradiction of the other verse, and that's where you get that it's potentially. Um, um, uh, no, I skipped. Okay, here's the question that people were asking before and the other thing, now they're asking it here. How did they know? How did they know? Now, here the question is not how did they know if they have relations or not. How did they know how old these women were, right? These babies, right? Okay, it's very hard to tell people's ages, right? How did they know who was three and who wasn't? They didn't, like, do check everyone's birth certificates and say, okay, let's, you know, let's see who's what age and then know where the cutoff age was. So, apparently, they had some miraculous, or maybe a little less miraculous, we'll see, type of way of figuring it out. Amrav Huna Bar Bizna, Amar Rabbi Shimon Chasida, Hevirum Lifnei Hatzitz. They passed them in front of the seats. The seats was this breast, this head plate the Kohen Gadol would wear that would help determine all sorts of things that we didn't know about. So they would put them in front of the seats. Now, when they passed them in front of the seats, okay, the, with the Kohen Gadol wearing it, kosha panam morikot, if her face went sallow, which means like it turned yellowish brownish, then biyaduashi ru yali ba'el. Then you would know that she was of age. Kosha ein panam morikot biyaduashi ein ru yali ba'el. Some of this would make some miraculous effect on those people and not those people, and that's how they knew. Amar Av Nachman, Siman La'avera Hidrokan. Hidrokan, it was a disease, some people think it's from the intestines, there was some disease that would maybe make your face turn yellowish, brownish, and that was a Siman for sin. Now here it's a little tricky because they're confusing, but their basic assumption was, once they were three, they clearly must have had relations with somebody, which is a little bit weird to understand, but again, if you live in times where, and, and the enemies at the time, you know, there was a lot of sexual you know, things going on, and it really could be that women were often raped at that age. It's really ha- hard to know, but it could be that um, that this would actually, you know, be a siman. In other words, here they're saying that they actually had engaged in sin, and then they believed that hydrocon was a sign for sin. Okay, the hydrocon would often make your belly swell. It's kind of similar to the sota, um, but apparently would also make your face turn brownish, and that would also be an indicator. Okay, if you didn't think this was strange, it's going to be even stranger. In the Pilegish Begiva, okay, in the story at the end of Sefer Shoftim, when they kill out right after they chopped up this woman, so they, they, there was a, a, a civil war between the Binyamin, Shevet Binyamin, the tribe of Benjamin, and everyone else, and they killed many of the people. And then they found this one city that hadn't been part of it, and they end up the Yoshve Gilad. What happened was then they started to get worried that no one was going to marry and it went to Binyamin, and Binyamin would be wiped out entirely, which they didn't want to happen either. So then they found these par- these people who weren't part of the, they hadn't come with the rest of the nation to fight. So they decided, we have to kill all these people, but we're going to keep alive the Bitulot in the city. Okay? So anyone who was a virgin will keep alive, and then we'll have them marry the Binyamin people, and then we'll resolve a bunch of issues. So they found 400 virgins who had never slept with a man before. So the obvious question, and this is why we're bringing it, because we're showing, how did they determine these things? Okay, this is a little bit strange, or a lot strange. They put them on top of a barrel of wine with no clothes underneath, no undergarments. Now the assumption was, if you had had relations, it was wider, which means the, the wine could go into your body much easier, which means it would then come out through your mouth, the smell of the wine. So if they would smell her breath, you could smell it, then you would know that she had had relations. It's a very strange way to test this. Bitula ein rechano def. Okay, if she was a virgin, you wouldn't be able to smell anything because it was, again, it was kind of blocked underneath there, so the, the smell of the wine couldn't go up through her body. Again, I don't think this is a real test, but they use this apparently according to this as a test. And then the Gemara asks an obvious question. Right, this is a very strange way to do it. Why don't you just not renew the seats? Put them before the seats. Now remember, if they're virgins, they get to live. 
If they're not, they get killed with the people of Yavesh Kelat. So, Amar Rav Kana Bereid Rav Natan Liratzon Lehem Ktiv Liratzon Velo the Purenut. The the seats was used Liratzon Lehem to be for good things. It's not used for bad things. Usually, it atoned for sin, sins like of tuma that was done by accident if someone worshipped in the temple and they were impure or something. It would atone for sins. It's not supposed to come to determine are you going to die. So they say, well, Ihachi b'midyan nami. Well, they used it in Midyan for that purpose. So they say, Amar Rav Ashi lahem ktiv lahem liratzon velo lepornu lulumata olam afilu lepornu. For Jews, it's only helpful. For non-Jews, it could even be for bad things. Very strange section. Uh, but it, what I like about it is they address the question we were wondering, which is how would you be able to determine such a thing, right? It might be their answer was a little bit strange, but at least they, they do have this question of how on earth are we supposed to figure this out? Now the question is, do we hold like Rabbi Shimon Yochai or not? I'm Rabbi Yaakov, I see you're saying it was to marry the Binyamites, but anyone who wouldn't would be killed. So that's the poor Anut. Okay. He says in the name of Rabbi Yaakov, he says in the name of Rabbi Shimon Levi, Halachaka Rabbi Shimon Yochai. So Amr le Rabbi Zera le Rabbi Yaakov Reidi befei Rishmi Alach only Chalal Rishmi Alach. This is a question they like to ask. Did you learn this? Did he say it explicitly, or did you infer it from some psak he had somewhere else? So what does he say? My Chalala. What? So first, before he even answers the question, they say, "What's the Chalala? Where do you? Where could you have learned it from? If you derived it from some story?" The Amr Rabbi Shabbat Levi Ira Chatei Taba Eretz Yisrael Shekaral Av Ir Ar. There was a city that. There was some rumors that there was some improper relationship there. Because she gave Rabbi at Rabbi Romanus Ubatkai sent his rabbi Rabbi Romanus to check the situation. Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi tells this story that Rabbi Romanus found out there was a convert who had converted under the age of three, married to a coin, and Rabbi said, "Oh, that's not a problem." So what do you see here? It sounds like. You can infer from there that Rabbi Shoban Levi holds like Rabbi Shem Yochai, because he said Rabbi allowed this. Amrle, so that was where we could have learned to be Klala. Now we go back to the story. They asked Rabbi Yaakov or Edi, did you learn it miklala, or did he say it explicitly? So Amrle but Fever Shmeli, I heard it explicitly. So then they say, Imi what if he had heard it from the story? Could you have inferred this? So he says, Well, this is why. This is the issue. You could have distinguished between the cases. She was already married to him, so we let her stay, but not necessarily that she could do it. Now we go back to where we started today. Right? Oh, so now they say, right? There he said, You could stay married. So that's why maybe we let her stay married. But here, but if it's lechatchila, we might not allow it. So then they say <coughs> you can't compare the cases. Hachi ashta bishlam ahatam sofaliyot bogeret tachtav sofaliyot bula tachtav hacha sofaliyot zonat tachtav. Oh, or question sofaliyot zonat tachtav. The only reason they were allowed to stay married before was because if she was too old, well, eventually she'll be older when she married him, and if she was um, a mukad eitz, eventually her hymen will tear with him. So what's the difference? She could stay married. But here, you're going to say, oh, well, in any case, she ha- will have slept with someone else while she's married to him? No. In the end, she's a zona, so we shouldn't allow this anyway. Rav Safra, man ilamichlala. He learned it out, not the Rabbi Yosho ben Levi, not like Rabbi Yaakov Ridi, he heard it explicitly, but he learned it out from the story. Ve, and then, kashele umashane lehacha. And then they asked the question, and then he answered it like they did just before. We're going to end with this one story about this. We're going to see how strong people felt about this. Okay, so there was Cohen who did this. He married this woman. Rabbi Shimon Yochai would have permitted this, right? And so would, according to what we said, Rabbi Shimon Levi and Rabbi Yaakov Reidi, right? Who said in their name. So I'm a Rabbi Nachab Rabbi Yitzchak, my high. So Rabbi Nachab Rabbi Yitzchak says, what's going on here? How could he have done this? I'm a lay. They said to him, "Dama Rabbi Yaakov Reidi, I'm a Rabbi Shimon Levi, Alachak Rabbi Shimon Yochai. We're going by the Pesach Alachad that we learned from him. Rabbi Nachab Rabbi Yitzchak got very upset and he said, he has to divorce her right now. I'm going to take Rabbi Yaakov Reidi out of your ears, meaning you will never hear from him again, meaning you will not ever hold by him, okay? In other words, I don't go by what Rabbi Yaakov Reidi says, and no way, no how can she marry. So you see, he felt very, very strongly about this psika. So we see these two approaches, and tomorrow we're going to see a different um, lenient opinion of Rabbi Shem Baruch We don't always view him as a lenient kind of person, and here we see some lenient opinions 
um, of his. We'll end here for today and Shabbat Shalom.